So when you had initially, you and your team and, and whatnot, when you guys initially said, look, dinosaurs on feathers, it's a thing. <laughs> um, who do you, do you think you could name like some of the big guys who are against that? Well, there were two in particular, and um, um, certainly Fiducia was one, and uh, Larry Martin from Kansas was another one, and uh, then we had a number of other people uh, right around the world, in fact, uh, who were either ornithologists or paleontologists, but uh, the ones that were outstanding really were Fiducia and Larry Martin. And uh, they had the most at stake in the sense that they put their career reputations on the fact that dinosaurs cannot give rise to birds. Yeah. I'll bet on my life that dinosaurs did. <laughs> exactly. Which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I do have a, a pretty, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to send it to you, but uh, I do have a pretty funny picture. It's like, um, it's like Robert Bacher and he has like, he's holding like an Archaeopteryx in his hand or something. And it's like dinosaurs had feathers deal with it. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you've seen that before. No, I haven't actually. Yeah, I'll I'll try to send it to you maybe. Um, but so it's one question to ask: Did dinosaurs have feathers? Which some certainly did. Um, but it's quite another question to ask: Why did they have feathers? You know, for example, the ones in Alberta. Uh, I don't I don't know their names. Uh, so maybe you could explain their names and then explain. The hypotheses on why they had feathers. Well, I think all the specimens that we have that had good feathers on them that people would uh, not question as being feathers, they're all small theropods, small meat eating dinosaurs. And actually, Bacher came up with the idea way back when why they would have feathers. Uh, he basically said that, um, you know, if you're a small animal, you have a very large surface area on your body, lots of skin compared to the volume in your body. And this difference means that uh, you're losing body heat very fast. And it's the reason why uh, mice, for example, or uh, moles and really small animals, mammals, uh, they have to eat their body weight basically every day. Um, it's to keep the fires stoked so that they can stay warm. Now, if dinosaurs are warm-blooded, and then you have small warm-blooded dinosaurs, those animals have a problem with loss of heat and uh, they need some kind of insulation on their bodies. And uh, uh, this is the most sensible thing, I think, or sensible explanation for why the feathers probably developed in the first place. And uh, it makes sense that when you look at an animal like Sinoceratrix, for example, that it has um, kind of hair-like or down-like um, feather-like structures on the outside of the body and there, there's something to help preserve the heat of the animal and uh, so that uh, uh, it's not just going to be uh, dumping heat all the time and eating all the time to try and make up for that. Uh, but once you've got feathers, of course feathers are a wonderful adaptation for so many things. So for example, you can color them and suddenly you've got uh, a way of attracting a potential mate uh, or scaring off some other animal that's smaller than you or <laughs> maybe more vicious uh, just by saying um, that you either don't taste good or that you're kind of mean and uh, they should stay away from you. Yeah. Uh, so th there's all these reasons for visual signals. Uh, and this also comes down to, uh, you know, making the feathers bigger in places. That's why you have, you know, peacocks with these gigantic uh, uh, tail feathers that uh, are used, of course, for attracting mates and so on. Um, so a lot of reasons for having feathers. Once once you've got them, you can adapt them into uh, both physical or colored um, aspects of, of attracting potential mates or scaring something else off. Uh, but... Um, once you have long feathers or stiff feathers, then of course you start to use them for other things too. Um, you know, one idea that uh, Oscar had come up with a long time ago was that, uh, well, if you've got uh, long stiff feathers behind your arms, maybe what you're doing is using them to beat down insects so you can eat the insects mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a capture mechanism. I don't think most people 
believe that one, but it's, it's a good explanation. Why not? Um, but if you've got long feathers behind your arms, then of course you have a slight aerodynamic problem or an advantage, as the case may be. If you're running away from something, for example, a slightly bigger dinosaur who's out to catch you, and you reach the edge of a cliff or um, a ditch or something, and you've got these uh, uh, structures behind your arms that you can spread out and uh, cushion yourself so that you can fly through the air or glide through the air for a short distance, you've got an advantage there right away. And uh, once you have that advantage and um, selection starts working on it, then of course they can, it can start to push you in a certain direction, which leads to gliding or eventually to flight. So there's another idea. Uh, One idea that I like a lot relates to the fact that the long feathers behind the arms of ornithomimosaurs um, are perfect for covering up their nests of eggs. And when you look at their nests of eggs, their nests of eggs are like donuts. Um, basically what happened is that these dinosaurs stood in one spot, they laid two eggs, turned their bodies, laid two more eggs, turned their bodies, laid two more eggs, and so on. So they're standing in one spot, just turning around. And eventually the first circle closes. At the same time they're doing that, they're using their arms to scoop sand onto the first layer of eggs. Then they lay a second layer of eggs, and sometimes even a third layer of eggs. Now, you end up with this donut with the mother dinosaur standing in the middle of the donut, in the hole, essentially. You've scooped all the sand onto it, so in fact, you're on a mound of eggs now. You're not um, not digging the nest the way that uh, some birds do. And uh, uh, then you can uh, brood or protect those eggs. And uh, we have at least half a dozen uh, specimens now where the mother dinosaur died on the nest of eggs. And the mother is standing essentially in the hole. Her arms are spread out over the eggs on the side. Her chest is on the eggs at one end of the nest. Her tail is on uh, the eggs at the other end of the nest. But you have a big uh, group of eggs between the arms, which are outstretched, and the body. But if you uh, put the feathers on that dinosaur, and those long feathers that you see on the arms of animals like Codiptrix, what you realize is that those eggs in between the arms and the body are in fact now covered by the feathers. So the... um, One idea that was presented is that these animals uh, may have, in fact, developed those feathers as a way of protecting the eggs between the arms and the body when the mother was brooding the eggs. And uh, I think it's a fantastic idea because we have uh, mother dinosaurs sitting on the nest with their arms stretched out like that. And just imagine the feathers being on the backs of the arms there. And it's, it's absolutely perfect. All those eggs are protected. So I I actually like that idea. Um, It's a publication by uh, uh, two scientists called Hawk and Orson. And a pretty pretty neat idea. And I think uh, at least partly explains. Uh, Long feathers, of course, can also be used for display. We know that birds use uh, long feathers on their arms and their tails as a way of attracting mates. Um, And they they go through all these elaborate dances and so on. Why not dinosaurs? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I actually heard about that uh, hypothesis about the the feathers having an, at least evolved uh, uh, a way to like um, like you said, was it broom protect the feather uh, the the eggs right? So I'd heard about that, but I forgot about that for some reason. So uh, that had slipped my yep. mind. Um, I don't know why, but. Uh, well, it doesn't get talked about as much as it should be, in yeah, my opinion. <laughs> I, I think I I think it might actually um, I think it might actually be legit. Um, maybe. Yeah. Um, but uh, so also some have suggested that it was evolved, and that some dinosaurs later evolved true flight after this. Not avian dinosaurs, of course, uh, like Microraptor and um, what's whatever, right? So. Do you think that some 
dinosaurs, non avian dinosaurs, evolved true flight shortly after or after the evolution of, uh, of feathers, like Microraptor or Cyanotosaurus? Yeah, I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, there's adaptations, especially in the small theropod dinosaurs, that suggest that many of them may have lived in trees. Um, you know, you think about the uh, uh, big raptorial claw, for example, in Dromaeosaurus. Uh, well, that's a perfect adaptation. We're going up a tree. <laughs> you know, uh, it's very much like um, what uh, the electricians used to do when they went up uh, telephone poles. They had a big spike on the inside of their boot, and they would use that as a way of climbing up those poles. And uh, uh, that's not saying that all those dinosaurs did that, ad, but maybe some of them probably did. So things like Microraptor, for example. I think it's a perfect explanation for, for what they were using them for. Um, it's not the only thing you, you can have to, uh, you know, you don't need to have just one function for these things. You can have multiple functions. So it can be used for pinning down prey or even ripping open prey in some, some cases as well. But, but uh, maybe it's one of the, the adaptations that they have that show that uh, at least some dromaeosaurs were well up, well up in the trees and are boreal already. And uh, then you start having uh, long feathers on your, your body and, uh, you know, suddenly you've got the perfect adaptation for gliding from tree to tree or jumping and uh, extending your jump, so to speak, uh, from one tree to another. And uh, we know so many animals that have taken advantage of this. Uh, it really is a pretty amazing thing, uh, flight or gliding, uh, whether it's active flight or, or gliding. And, uh, um, you know, we have uh, flying frogs, which have these membranes between their toes uh, that give them um, a way of gliding uh, for a further distance from tree to tree. We have lots of uh, flying squirrels of different uh, lineages, or, or bats and, and mammals as well, of course, are active flyers. And we have flying snakes. I mean, who could imagine a flying snake? And yet, uh, in Southeast Asia, you've got uh, snakes that basically extend their ribs, uh, flatten themselves out, and uh, end up having um, a glide ratio so that they can go from tree to tree as well, through the air. Um, flying fish. <laughs> and these animals come out of the water and um, go for a distance until they're safe, and then they're back in the water again. But... Um, all these animals, plus, of course, insects, are fantastic what they've done with flight. Um, so uh, flying mechanisms are something that just get reinvented over and over and over again. Why not dinosaurs?